median crossover work in Northampton County on the eastern shore and uh, Route 460, Route 258 turn lane improvements. So these are six additional projects that we did not have uh, approved were now added to the list. So um, I think that brings our grand total up over about 33 projects for the region now in uh, Route 3 smart scale. So that was, that was really some great news. It. That is it. Okay, uh, so we just heard from Chris Hall CTV updates, and now I'm going to call on Christopher Hall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, uh, as you know, we were we were getting ready to bring before the board uh, the last meeting of our Hill study. Uh, we've decided to uh, postpone that. We'll be bringing that study back to the board. Uh, July meeting, there's some additional information we wanted to look at uh, as a result of some of the comments coming out of the CPAC meeting last week, so or last last month. So we will we'll be reviewing some additional information uh, with that uh, study and be bringing that study back to the board for enforcement uh, in July. Uh, in terms of our major project updates. We, have, we do have we've been up on segment two. That project is, uh, is really in the closeout stage, and we're going to be uh, conducting a ribbon cutting ceremony on 13 June at 11, 11 o'clock. Uh, and uh, that project is, is on track. Uh, final punch of the site is to be closed out. Uh, segment three, uh, as you're going, moving forward, further west up to up 64 there, uh, you can see continue. Clearing and grubbing, they're, they're working on stormwater basins and uh, some of the initial prep work for the Queen, Queens Creek Bridge replacement. And then on the south side, uh, as you're moving in and around uh, 264 there, you can see the flyover coming over. Uh, it will attach to the uh, eastbound uh, 264 uh, from the uh, 64 interchange there, uh, westbound. And then uh, also uh, completing the South Newtown Bridge improvements. Uh, phase two piece of that further to the east. Uh, biggest uh, pieces there, you see some of that approach work really coming on to the pile driving activities. We work on that, that approach that will bring the flyover and connect over to Cleveland Street there uh, and complete that connection down through the Woodstock Road. And then lastly, uh, on the high rise bridge. Uh, you can see the first <coughs> tile cap form work up on the uh, on one of the uh, west side land piers there. That's about a 20 ton piece of form work that's sitting up on top of that. That uh, that's the first pier cap that's been poured, uh, and we're uh, moving along quite nicely with that project. The only other item to report there is uh, Great Bridge Boulevard abutment work is, is coming along. But that, that project is, for the most part, that the site is completely under the board and we reach that project. Unless there's any questions, sir, that's all I have. Questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the art uh, PT update that you for the world. Good morning. A couple of updates from DRPT. Earlier this month, we launched our new Commute Virginia application. This is a, a mobile phone app that allows users to look for carpool, vanpool, transit, and rail options for their travel. Uh, they can log their trips and earn rewards for using uh, greener transportation options. We're really excited about that. And the traffic program here in Hampton Roads is one of the five commuter assistance agencies in the state that are partnering with us on that launch. On the rail side, our Amtrak ridership continues to be very strong. It's up almost 15% year over year statewide. Uh, but when you look at the Hampton Roads routes, uh, it's up over 75% year over year for the Norfolk routes. That's really driven by the second Norfolk train. And up 11, uh, almost 12% uh, year over year for the Newport News routes, um, based on some schedule optimization of those routes that uh, also came online. Uh, we did also announce some new Virginia Amtrak discounts earlier this month. It's a 15% discount for trips that connect Virginia cities up to D.C. Uh, so we're hoping that that's also going to stimulate additional ridership. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Review Board update, Kathy Lee. Good morning. Uh, our major infrastructure projects continue to move along nicely. Uh, at big will be complete. We're just finishing uh, punch list items at this point on the final rail bundle. So that project will be completed as of May 31st, and we'll be doing a rail demonstration of the new technology for uh, some of our major customer shipping lines. Um, both Norfolk Southern and CSX will be there um, for that. So we're excited for that project to be complete. Phase two of MIT is about halfway done. So um, by mid-July, phase two will be finished. We have cleared the area for phase three. Um, the truck reservation system, also um, we continue to extend the mandatory hours. We're now until 2 p.m. at both MIT and Bay, helping measure that flow um, of motor carrier traffic throughout the day. And the turn times at Bay are down to 34 minutes. And at Big, uh, I mean, sorry, at MIT, uh, they're right around 42 minutes. So we're um, seeing good efficiency come from that program and we'll continue to extend those hours. The specifications for the first segment of the deepening and widening project have been approved by the Army Corps, so we'll be going out for bid for the first segment of dredging um, in the beginning of July uh, so that we can have dredges in the water by uh, January of 2020. Also, I noted last time that um, the Freight Transportation Advisory Committee has been reinstituted and been uh, doing some good work. And David White is here uh, representing FTAC this morning, and I'd like to defer the rest of my time, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, for him just to give a brief update on what they've been working on. Hey, David. Thank you, yes. My name is David White, Executive Vice President of the Maritime Association and a member of the Freight Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you, Kat. Um, the Freight Transportation Advisory Committee, FTAC, is a standing committee of the TPO who was created to provide voice to freight in the regional planning process. Following a period of inactivity, the Port Authority, in partnership with the TPO, has reconvened, um, has reconvened. Uh, the committee late this last year. Since December 2018, FTAC has met four times and taken action to recommend revisions to the HRTPO project prioritization tool and has recommended 70 projects to address freight needs on the transportation system for the 2045 long range transportation plan. <coughs> Additionally, the FTAC has received briefings and provided comments on the HRPDC economic development sites inventory, the regional connector study, Regional Smart Scale Projects, and the Bowers Hill Interchange Study. We look forward to continuing to support the HRTPO and appreciate the opportunity to have freight needs represented in the transportation planning process. Thank you. Thank you very much for the update. Okay. Um, let's see. What update does that provide? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We don't have any substantive update this morning. I'm just saying thank you for all the support recently. Um, and everything changing and uh, how transit is, is funding other things and uh, all the staff and uh, more support. We have a question. I remember last year we had a, a public hearing here for the six year plan. Is that going to happen again? I don't know what goes with it. So the six year uh, public hearing was actually held by VDOT about two weeks ago out in Suffolk. It will still be an opportunity to provide comments. All right, uh, William Harrell, uh, HRT. Good morning. Um, in the outer corridor on the table, we have two flyers. Please uh, grab them. Uh, the first relates to the what we're calling the tour of Hampton Roads. And there hadn't been more excitement about a tour since the Grateful Dead's last year. <laughs> <laughs> you don't miss this one. Maybe that's a bit of a <laughs> but uh, we are meeting in all six cities of HRT's uh, service area, getting feedback from citizens uh, in terms of you know current challenges with the existing transit system and looking at potential scenarios and how to improve that. As you will recall, that's part of um, the strategic planning process, and I want to thank Mr. Brewer for the support of the state in that regard. So please check that out. The final item is we are having a transportation innovation forum. We're holding that in Portsmouth on Tuesday, May 28th at 5.30 to 7.30. 
uh, please come to that. It's heavy hors d'oeuvres. There's also a cash bar. That's one way to get good attendance. And we're going to be looking at, uh, we have a national expert uh, from the Center of Automated uh, uh, Research in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We want to talk about uh, autonomous vehicles and electrification technologies. We know from a transportation standpoint, and even from a, a transit standpoint, how we provide service tomorrow will be very different than today. So with the state support, we are also part of a national consortium looking at automated transit vehicles. So please come see us uh, Tuesday evening, May 28th, uh, at the Renaissance at 5.30 p.m. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the CTAC update, uh, Ms. Danaher. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, we did not meet this month. We moved our meeting to June to give more time for people to give input on our bylaws, which now need to be revised to incorporate our new duties for the PDC. Uh, we'd like to formalize that and uh, finish up our input and then have you all look over it so that we are not a lawless bunch just sitting around the table discussing things that, that happen in the region. Um, that's pretty much it for us. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll talk to you or hear from the military liaison. Uh, liaisons. So the first one will be uh, Ms. Jerry Grimes from uh, Langley Fort Easton. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. We have no cut of the Okay. And then for the Navy, Captain uh, Michael Moore. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I have no updates for the group. Thank you. Okay, from the Coast Guard, uh, Lieutenant Commander Pete Francisco. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just several updates on a few ongoing projects. The uh, Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project, uh, Coast Guard has begun a monthly contact with uh, Orsted, the contracted company uh, for Dominion Energy, uh, to ensure navigation safety uh, during the construction of the uh, offshore wind farm, uh, the first in uh, federal waters in, in the region. Um, second, we continue a discussion with the uh, VDOT on the HRBT expansion, of course. And uh, uh, a timely item, we, the North Landing Bridge uh, by the Virginia Beach, Chesapeake border, uh, suffered, and that's owned and operated by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, suffered a uh, electrical malfunction. It's been uh, last week, and so it's been unavailable for maritime traffic and at times uh, uh, road and vehicle traffic. And um, efforts are actually going on right now to try to correct that by either uh, close business today or, or tomorrow to restore that uh, to normal schedule function. Um, and we'll continue uh, monitoring with the Corps of Engineers on that. So thank you very much. Okay. I'll back up just a second for Ms. Grimes. Um, Ms. Grimes, in the paper recently from Langley for, uh, for Langley, they were talking about the F 22s coming in uh, for a training squadron. And, the Air Force going through the process of taking input from the community? Yes, sir. Um, I don't have um, the seven cabinets in the back. Okay, and, and for everybody's information, when you do that, uh, since that's going to be a, a significant up increase in air traffic uh, activity at Langley, it would be nice to know uh, when the decision will be made. Uh, by the Air Force to make that move. And for those of you that are not aware of it, the F-22s were at Tyndall Air Force Base, which got hammered pretty bad by the hurricane. So now they're, they're looking at moving them, the F uh, squadron, train squadron, to Langley, and then replace, uh, I think the F-35 would be F-35 training to Tyndall. So it's kind of you know, a plus-plus for the Hampton Roads and, and for the Air Force. So we look for more information on that. Yes, Okay, great, thank you. All right, and we'll hear from uh, our, our own Sheila Wilson who referenced the 2020 uh, budget. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Board. Sorry. <laughs> I am pleased to um, present a summary of the FY20 budget for your consideration and approval. The proposed FY20 budget maintains the locality membership dues of 80 cents per capita. It provides for a 2.5 salary increase for staff. It reflects only 17% increase in personnel costs, and that is due to retirements and um, a lower indirect cost rate this year, next year. 
This results in a total budget decrease of $1.27 million, and the majority of this decrease is due to pass-through expenditure. In your agenda packet, you will find several um, comparison reports providing historical information and revenue sources by expenditures for expenditures by programs. Since the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission is, a, is the administrator for the transportation or planning organization, these reports represent the entire organization and provide a step perspective on the financial situation of the organization as a whole. HR TPO's total budget for FY20 is 12.72% um, lower than the FY19 budget, and that's totally because of pass-through expenditures. The overall expenditures are expected to decrease by 13%, even with a budgeted 2.5 salary increase for staff. Again, this decrease is due to pass-through expenditures. This slide shows membership dues and state allocations for the last 25 years. These funds sources provide federally mandated matching funds for certain federal grant awards, as well as administrative support, um, building, maintenance and supplies, and various assistance to special programs requested by the localities. Several budget considerations will affect our future financial position. And one thing is the regional building is 33 years old and the maintenance costs are constantly increasing. Healthcare costs continues to rise. We provide competitive salaries for, um, to maintain our staff. And we do plan to hope to um, establish an OPEC trust fund for our pension liability and several of our IT and communication systems no longer are under warranties and parts are becoming unavailable. And that includes our network servers, our operation software, and our telephone system and conference room facilities. We do hope, and we, or at least we do plan to continue to fund our reserves to help support our future improvement needs. Um, I'm happy that's been my um, Discussion. I'm happy to answer any questions. Is there any questions? Uh, well, that will be an action item uh, 18F. Um, and if I may, um, the budget that um, Ms. Wilson has just presented to you um, comes forward to you from the Personnel and Budget Committee, the Joint Budget Committee, and the PDC and TPO, who uh, reviewed that at their last two meetings and this morning. Uh, took action with a recommendation for All right, and we'll hear from uh, we'll hear from the recommendations on that and get into the action items. Okay, let's see. Next we'll hear from uh, Christopher Hall. Uh, this will be the I sixty four regional express lane update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, I'm here this morning to provide uh, the preliminary results of our operational analysis on the I-64 Express Lanes Network. Just to remind everybody that these are preliminary results. Uh, we will be back uh, to pr present results, final results to the board in July. And this is also the first time uh, that we have looked at uh, this reach of the 64 network uh, as a continuous network. Heretofore, it's really been a series of patchwork projects, but this is really the first time we've looked at it as a continuous network. I'd also like to point out in the room, I have our uh, project management uh, team lead, Mr. Uh, Tim Hayden, uh, in the back, as well as uh, some great work from our uh, consultant and the RD technical uh, engine traffic engineer on this project, Mr. Raj Karadkar, also uh, in the room with us today. Okay, what I'd like to start off with is just 
just kind of laying out the task that we had uh, before us is really twofold, and that was to conduct the analysis of the baseline network um, and evaluate two changes from that baseline network. Uh, and throughout this study, we refer to the baseline network as scenario one, and then the uh, scenario two includes the two changes uh, to that best baseline. Now I'll describe those just for everybody's refreshment as I move through this here. In terms of the scope, uh, this study covered uh, the 40 mile uh, long uh, distance between Hampton and Chesapeake there, uh, as indicated, between those two circles up there on the chart, uh, starting uh, just west of the I-664 interchange uh, near West Mercury Boulevard in Hampton, and then proceeds westward uh, through uh, the network all the way down to uh, Bowers, the Bowers Hill Interchange 664, 264 area at the Dock Landing Road in Chesapeake. So that is the that is the area that we looked at in terms of the express lane network. The study included uh, the two scenarios uh, that I mentioned uh, as part of our task. Uh, the baseline scenario uh, highlighted in orange by the orange boxes there is the network that this, this board endorsed last year, which is, which is essentially the current network that we will see in 2025 when we have all of our major projects completed, which includes uh, the Hampton Roads bridge tunnel expansion, the high-rise bridge uh, expansion, the 64-264 interchange work. Um, that is the network which we will have in 2025, which is described as the baseline network. I think some people have described this as the and having the, the hot networks only at the water crossings. So that's essentially our baseline in 2025. Scenario two uh, looked at essentially two changes to that baseline. In scenario two, we extended the entrance of the uh, hot network on the west end of the HRBT, further to the west, uh, in, in, the, in the baseline scenario, when you're traveling uh, eastbound, coming into the network, that entrance to the uh, hot lane system or the managed lane system begins right around the uh, settler's landing area. In scenario two, we looked at modifying where that entrance to the managed lane would be and moving that further to the west up towards LaSalle. The other change uh, that is reflected in scenario two is converting the high, oc high occupancy vehicle lanes uh, between 264 and 464, which are, are part of the baseline. We looked at converting those to a managed hot lane uh, reach or part of the system. So those are the only two differences between the baselines. Moving that entrance further to the west on the, uh, on the west side of the network and converting the HOV to a hot lane portion of the system. Uh, as I mentioned, the analysis year or the, the, uh, the year horizon that we looked at was 2025 and we looked at the peak periods in the a.m. between 6 and 9 a.m. and the peak periods in the p.m. between 3 and 6 p.m. The purpose really boils down to four points uh, and that is to understand what are those potential impacts uh, in the system or on that baseline system that we might see by the increased capacity coming through an expanded bridge tunnel project or, and also coming uh, from the expanded capacity uh, through Bowers Hill and over the high-rise bridge. And with that, 
identifying those potential future uh, operational challenges across that entire 2025 baseline network. So again, just to reinforce, we're not looking at points, you know, just project points, we're looking across this, the entire reach, that 40 mile reach of the network. Secondly is evaluate, that, evaluate the baseline system performance in terms of speed and uh, travel times. Provide a performance uh, comparison between uh, those two scenarios that I mentioned, the baseline scenario and uh, scenario two, which includes those two changes. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, it's really providing the best information possible to this body, uh, our regional leadership, uh, to inform what our future uh, network investments need to be and uh, helping to inform those decisions as we move forward. Just a few quick comments on the methodology because I think this is this is important to note. Um, we had to merge several different uh, kind of disparate models together to get us to a network system model. Uh, we used uh, the traffic, the region's traffic demand model uh, as our start point in which we were able to understand what those future volumes were going to look like. Uh, one important note is that uh, regional traffic demand model does account for how that traffic will shift within the region, across the region. So as we open up new capacity across uh, the Hampton Roads area there through the, through the tunnel expansion and as we open capacity across the high-rise bridge, the, the, the traffic demand model is a gravity model, so it adjusts based on uh, that additional capacity opening up. So understanding that, and then the second piece on our step one there was really determining what our, what our growth rates were going to be in order to get from our current uh, volumes to our projected 2025 volumes. And then in the second step, it's really a matter of we took those along with those other study uh, and analysis um, data that we did on uh, the NEPA evaluations for the high-rise bridge project, the NEPA evaluation and study we did for the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, took those and stitched those together uh, into uh, the information that was coming out of our regional traffic demand model uh, to, to create sort of that baseline network. Uh, then there's a system and a process of, of balancing and making sure that there's uh, essentially at the connection points within the various segments in the model and network that they make sense and that, uh, that we truly have the system connections throughout the, throughout the model. And then the next step is to apply the growth rates to that baseline to get us to a 2025 baseline model across the system. And then the last step is then really where it's important for the, the granular operational analysis is to apply those volume inputs into our micro simulation. And that's where we really got the granularity of how individuals, individual vehicles interact across across the network. So this this model will give us a pretty powerful tool not not just for this effort but other future alternatives that the field may want to look at to really look at uh, all the different intersections and interchange points across across the network. And this this is a tool that we haven't had until we put this this model together. <laughs> okay, in terms of draft operational results, this is, this is kind of the bottom line, what we've gotten so far out of our preliminary results. We see five, what we call hot, hot areas or hot spot locations or locations of congestion that we found when we did the analysis. 
in both scenarios across that network. And I'll walk through each one of those and sort of provide a heat map that sort of shows where we think we think the cause of that congestion might be um, as we move forward for further analysis. The other point that I would make here is uh, generally over the entire network, uh, the model shows that most of the congestion occurs in the eastbound direction during the PMP. So our first point is at the uh, at the point between Mallory Street and Settlers Landing, um, and then also uh, on the south or east side of the bridge tunnel between 564 and West Bay Avenue. So what we see um, in the uh, in the in the uh, a, a PM, AM, excuse me, eastbound direction. Uh, we see some queuing uh, and congestion forming right at the mouth of the tunnel. This is uh, similar to what we see today, although drastically less uh, in our model based on the uh, weaving and uh, actions that are occurring uh, at the Settlers Landing intersection and Mercury, uh, or correction, Mallory Street intersections that are just before you enter the tunnel on the, on the uh, west side. Downstream, what we see is um, congestion forming as a result of uh, some of the weaving action uh, and maneuvering coming out of the uh, managed lane on the uh, west, uh, the uh, south end of the tunnel where drivers are trying to get over into the 564 and move to the uh, to the base. So, what that's causing in the um, in the AM peak is congestion to begin to build uh, right there uh, at the 564 interchange between West Bay and 564. And let me just back up a second to to walk you through how these charts work. I, I apologize for not doing that, but across the vertical there, you have the uh, the time frame, uh, moving from the early peak period, early hours in the peak period, later in the morning. And then down the right-hand vertical, you have essentially where the locations of that congestion is. And then the red box, the, the boxes indicate average speeds across that area. So for instance, the green indicates essentially 70 miles an hour free flow, and that moves all the way down to the the heaviest red shaded areas which were are at between 10 and 0 miles an hour stop and slow traffic. So the takeaway for this chart is you see at about uh, 7 a.m. we start to see some of that congestion <coughs> as we get more traffic in that period it just begins to back up uh, closer towards the tunnel. We don't see any differences between the baseline scenario and uh, scenario two at this at this location. The next location is uh, in the PM uh, at at the in the eastbound direction between Mallory Street and Settlers Lane. So that same area that we looked at in the in the uh, What you see here. Again, in the general purpose lanes is that significant congestion forming uh, beginning right around uh, beginning of the peak period between 3 and 4 o'clock and moving on into uh, the later peak period there uh, up into six, the 6 o'clock, uh, 6 a.m. Uh, time frame. Again, this is the same cause of the congestion in this area where we have that interaction as traffic is moving in towards the tunnel. We have uh, uh, entrance both from Mallory Street and from Settlers Landing in that area, and the traffic moving into uh, the entrance to the tunnel at that point. What we do see is a difference in scenario two in the general purpose lanes, and the, 
The reason being is, again, as I mentioned, in scenario two, at this location, we have, we have looked at what is the effect of moving the entrance to that managed lane further to the west. So what this is, what we think this is producing is we're getting traffic sorted and into those managed lanes earlier, uh, meaning before they start getting down into that pinched area there in the settler's lane and Mallory area, and we're leaving that congestion in the general purpose lanes. So while we still do see some congestion, it's dramatically different in scenario two. The next area is uh, in the eastbound at the merge of Northampton uh, Boulevard Branch in the AM. And this is, uh, if you're traveling in the eastbound lane there uh, with traffic coming in, merging in onto the eastbound lane there from Northampton. It's merging both from the northbound east, or uh, Northampton east and west direction. So uh, we do see some congestion in that area. No real difference between the two scenarios here. The geometry is basically the same. Uh, if you, if you uh, picture this is where we have the reversible lanes through this, through this reach. The next area we look at uh, is uh, in the PM peak eastbound from I-64 eastbound to the I-64 uh, southbound loop ramp. Uh, just, just to the south of this location, if you're familiar that area, you're traveling eastbound towards the high-rise bridge. There's several movements going on in there, traffic coming. Uh, traffic uh, trying to move into the 464 uh, going towards Norfolk and traffic also trying to get over to get into that loop ramp to get in 464 uh, south and uh, 168. We do see some difference in this area between the two scenarios um, with the relief. Uh, in scenario two, if you recall, the one difference there is in scenario two, we do have a managed lane through this system, through this part of the system. So again, that traffic is already sorted in that managed lane, and we do see some relief in the general purpose lanes. And this area is indicated uh, on the right-hand side where you see the difference with scenario two. <clears throat> and then the last area we saw is the uh, is traveling in the westbound direction uh, into the HRBT tunnel entrance. Uh, I would just note here that these sort of a similar anomaly, similar type of pattern that, that we see now, although they're much less uh, capacity decrease or less uh, less congestion in terms of speed decrease through that area. Um, these are worst case scenarios in terms of those 2025 volumes. And uh, what, what we also see is, uh, in terms of having a managed land through this area, which I don't show on this chart, is uh, you do have you know, one option through that area uh, during this peak period that will give you essentially a free flow um, speed through that area in a managed land. So between 45, 50, 60 miles an hour through that area. We don't see any difference between scenario one, the baseline, and uh, scenario two through this area. The last chart I would like to show, and I mentioned this earlier, that uh, most of the congestion that we see is in the eastbound direction um, in the in the PM. This this chart depicts the travel time across the entire system in the eastbound direction. Uh, and along the, um, along the left vertical there, you have the cumulative travel times in 20 minute increments. Uh, along the bottom, you have the locations throughout the, throughout the network. So 
Uh, we're starting here at Mercury, and we're moving through the network with, with cumulative times of how long it takes you to get to these points in the network. So uh, the way to, to read this chart is this blue line represents the general purpose lanes in scenario two. This line represents the general purpose lanes in scenario one. I think this is a this really speaks to some of the differences between the two scenarios in terms of total time savings as you move through the through the network. Uh, again, just want to highlight that we see that what seems to be a relatively small geometric change bears out some pretty significant time savings uh, as we look at the models right now. And you know, you're beginning in the eastbound here. You're really decreasing your your travel times uh, just by moving that sort point and entrance to the, to the managed lane uh, on the west end of the Hampton uh, Roads British Tunnel. And then as you move through, uh, we're seeing about a, a 34 minute savings. You know, here essentially the middle of the network, and by the time we get to the end of the network. Uh, about a about a 40 minute savings between um, the uh, the two general performance of the, the general purpose lanes uh, throughout the system. So I think this really kind of when you look at the comparison between the two the two scenarios, this this really sort of tells the story. Uh, and again, these are preliminary results. You know, we still have some work to do, but they're going to roughly be, I think, correlate similarly as we move forward. The only other thing I would add up here is we, we did depict what your time flow looks like for the managed lanes. So, you know, the difference here is, you, you know, you're getting a managed lane option throughout the network uh, in scenario two, which even further decreases your travel times in a, with a reliable choice uh, throughout the network. You do see the same type of phenomena on the, on the baseline. The only difference here is there is some additional savings when you convert from HOV, which is indicated by the yellow hashed area, to um, the fully uh, managed hot network through that region. So, a lot of data presented. Again, we'll, we'll be back with final results uh, in July, but I just would like to leave the group with, with some key takeaways, and that is we really have to identify those five areas for, for further analysis to, again, clarify what we think the causality is there and begin to develop some of those solutions to mitigate uh, that congestion as we move forward. Uh, the initial Initial preliminary analysis does indicate that scenario two performs better than our baseline condition in 2025, uh, and that the managed lane options provide reliable trip alternatives throughout the network. Lastly, I would just, just reiterate that this is really a first step as we begin to get into this discussion on um, you know, how we're making uh, regional investment decisions uh, with regard to uh, future planning with uh, the 64 network. And again, that is this body's decision on how collectively we want to move forward uh, in the region and develop this network. And then lastly, again, we will continue to look at uh, those operational hotspots. Uh, we're, we're now in a phase of the analysis where we'll be continuing to receive that input from stakeholders, uh, inputs from the TPO staff, board members on uh, refining our, our study model to generate those final results. Uh, we'll be documenting those in a, in a uh, technical report, again, for delivery to you all in July. Um, 
determine those areas, uh, again, for more detailed operational study. Uh, that would, again, it, the end result here is how do we identify potential solutions uh, to mitigate some of those things we're seeing in the model. And uh, our current schedule brings us back to the HR TAC in June and back to this body in July with the final report. And that concludes my presentation. I'll take any questions. Okay, any questions? Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Quick, uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One, and you may have touched on this at the very beginning, and if you did, I apologize, I didn't catch it. Just for my purpose of understanding the studies, did you do a study with a comparison where there, where there was nothing in regards to the HOT language and the managed language just to see how the traffic flowed in general? Um, so I think from a compare and contrast, so between having no managed lanes in the system, right. we did not. Okay. And then the follow-up question, Mr. Chairman, would be when you refer to the hotspots. So everybody in this room knows, for example, that Granby Street at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, eastbound traffic is backed up. Uh, on the peninsula, oftentimes, when you see three lanes go to two right around Hampton University, in fact, there's a 664 offload going on to 64 to head towards the HRBT. Obviously, that, is that what you're referring to as hotspots, or, or are there other areas of consideration? Yeah. That's generally as you described. Okay. Thank you. All right, sure. Thank you. Um, one question to follow up with yes, uh, Delegate Yancey's question. Um, so, you did do a no. Uh, Hot lanes or uh, what's the term? Here, you know, all general purpose lanes, and that's because this committee basically agreed from the get go that we would have leads to the war process. So, that's right. Yes, sir. That that essentially is the baseline. Is what what was endorsed as the network and what is currently being constructed. So, what is currently being constructed as part of the bridge tunnel expansion. And what is currently being constructed as part of the high rise bridge project. Nothing else. Okay. Just about it, Ms. Pellett. Yes, I'm sort of building on Delegate Nancy's point as well about some of the hot spots. And um, I'm wondering if the analysis looks at all at the diversion into the, the, the city streets. So, for instance, in, in Hampton, along um, uh, Woodland. Mellon Street, Mallory, all of that, where people are trying to get around and what might happen if, and I know we've taken the position that we don't want to convert uh, general purpose lanes to hot lanes, but uh, that, that remains a concern of ours, especially if we lose general purpose lanes, do we force more traffic onto city streets? And of course, in Norfolk, we'd be looking at Granby and, and um, you know, others as well. So are, are you all looking at any of that effect in terms of the spillover into local municipal streets that people get off the interstate to try to avoid some of this? The micro simulation, and I might reach out to Raj to answer this question, does take into account every one of those interchanges. So volumes in and volumes out at every one of those interchanges. What it does, it doesn't go beyond the interchange though. So it, it won't look at you know areas further down, for instance, effects on settlers landing further down into the city of Hampton or uh, the effects of Mallory Street in the Phoebus. Or the, or the effects in Norfolk. I think we need to be looking at, at that and I don't know how, how we get some of that analysis into this but as you as you know the Norfolk and Hampton are bearing a lot of diversion into our neighborhood streets and it's increasingly problematic not only for residents but for businesses and I just think we have to be aware are we having some unintended secondary tertiary consequences when we're looking at, at the study. Mayor Rowe? Yes, and to speak to uh, Mary's point, uh, I think heavy emphasis will be put on that second bullet on your last slide. Uh, input, even if it means uh, that you delay uh, your schedule or you, you push your schedule out, I think it's really important that you get uh, heavy input from the localities. Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Any other that, questions? That, that's, that's really the stage that we're at, so we're welcome any comments. Okay. Uh, Chris, we really appreciate the briefing. I, I will tell you, by the time you got to the end of it, I, was, I got confused on what scenario one and scenario two was, or are. Okay. So, uh, if 
you could somewhere in here provide some cheat sheets so we can keep up with the scenario. So, I, so understanding the scenario will give you an understanding of what is basically going to happen here. Mr. Shepard, could I ask, um, Mr. Hall, could you um, could you maybe go back to your first heat map? And I'm I'm just going to try to draw a general conclusion here, but I just want to make certain that everybody's understanding what what I think we're seeing, and it sort of cuts to the chase. But um, so if you would go on to um, your, uh, number two hot spot. So that's the approach to HRBT. Um, this is after the HRBT project investment. Right? And what you're showing is um, rate of traffic movement on the general purpose lanes, the free lanes through the tunnel. So I just want to be clear um, what we'll be looking at in 2025 under this scenario after the project's complete. You can see that um, in that peak period in the afternoon, as, as I believe Mr. Hall said, about uh, 10 mile an hour movement, right, is a dark red. That's correct. Right, in the general purpose lane. Um, and then if you go on, let, let's go to the Norfolk side, if you can flip real quick. That's uh, one more name, right? That's that's actually on the Norfolk side there. Okay, yeah. so on the Norfolk side, um, uh, for, for the Norfolk representatives, you're seeing your red show up um, on at Fourth View, West Bay, etc. So, just wanted to high level. That's what we're seeing. Correct. We're still seeing pretty um, congested um, situations during peak period. I would also just remind everybody those are those are 2025 volumes. I mean, those are future projections. Um, so, not, not to get too deep into the modeling process because I'm I'll be out of my league when I'm talking about that. But these are these are just indicators of where we think we might need to address some problems in the future. This is not a you know 100 certainty on what reality is going to be, but it's it's a way for us to start to queue up and prioritize some of those areas that we need to know. So what what I was going to suggest is so we're going to have some hot spots and some key areas. And I think that the next step would probably be for your technical committee to be looking at this in quite a bit of detail. Working. Thank you, Chris, for just, I just want to clarify big picture where we're at. I think really we got some technical details that we've worked through. There's been funny indicated impacts on adjacent neighborhoods, and I see the Norfolk light coming on, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, okay, so my question really is, is with that, let's go to Mr. Rowe, and that comment, when this comes back in July, what is the expectation? And, and should it come back in July? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, my the let, me, let me get a little bit of a counter to that, okay? I, the, uh, there'll be a phase approach in the study, okay? So once you've achieved at least that phase of the study with the information, it may not be complete. We may have more questions and need more study. That's what I anticipate. But come back at least in July and tell us what you've got. Yeah, I, I think characterizing it, I mean, it's, it's going to finalize this piece of the scope that we're looking at. But it in no, by no means finalizes all the, all the analysis that we have to continue to do. So uh, completely uh, understand this is, this is an evolving discussion. And the good news is we now have a, a good micro simulation that takes us, a model, based model that takes us across the entire system. So we can now take some of those other inputs and look at, you know, what's going to be the discrete effect at Mallory, what's going to be the discrete effect at West Bay, um, do we want to look at just general purpose? We've, we've got to have what we have now is a baseline before we can sort of branch out to do those things. So, um, you know, certainly our intent, you know, my direction from the commissioner is that that is clearly the purpose of this exercise is to provide an analytical baseline and framework to start to look at those other pieces that the, the region sees as a problem. Yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. We've got to run out of time. Back and back. Uh, just a quick point. Okay. okay, so when we get to the end game of this, 
So we're not going to be actually at the end game. This is going to be an ongoing. It gives us a tool to get the analysis. Now, yes, sir. one of the questions that I think of, that members would like to know, we're not going to change, necessarily change any design. Because once that we've already got a contract going, you're going to have the design here, the handbrake bridge tunnel, you've got your entrance, your exit points. It's going to give us some information on the impact. Well, so am I right in assuming that we're not changing the design of the tunnel? Uh, yes, yes, sir. That's, that's, that's a correct statement, that's right? Correct. So what would we change from this? Uh, yeah. For instance, we, we can we can change the access point, like I said, the moving that access point. Well, that's a design change. Uh, so what's this? Not, not, the digging in the, with, so, we're, so when I say that, we're not eliminating the managed lanes throughout the tunnel, and that would be a major design change. If there's, if we have to move access points around a little bit, those are things that that we certainly can do. You know, there are other options in that contract, and I. I don't have the full scope of what those are that if the region would want to invest in those, like connecting ramps to take you directly to 564, that would be, those would be the type of options that could be exercised with additional investment uh, that we could, could exercise. But, um, well, that's a big statement. I mean, if you're, what you just said would be that once you come back to the study, we get an idea that what we're, what we're We've tried to solve a congestion problem, but not to create an additional congestion problem, just sort of moving this, you know, moving this thing around. So if we can do things like that, then we need to know that sooner rather than later, because there's going to be a funding line with that. It's got to go with the HR tax to be able to pay for this. Correct? That's correct. All right, so this is going to give us a point of information. The other part is that you could adjust, you know, I guess you could adjust the, you know, some idea of, lack of a better word, we'll call it the hot lanes or tolling, whatever you want to call it, in the various parts of your of the study. You make some maybe some adjustment times and when you would do this or whatever to help mitigate some of that. So there's a lot of options or some options that can be done. Right? That is correct. Okay. So we're not gonna solve it here, but the study is gonna come back in July. That's your game plan. You can answer more ask we could ask more questions. You can put more stuff in the study. How much would pay for this study, by the way? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Good. You Doug, get it. Very good. What are we going to be asked to do in July? Are we going to be asked to accept the study, or we're just going to get an update? Sounds like we're just getting. I think this is, looks like to me that you guys should be coming back with more questions because it's going to. It's, this thing can't help but generate more questions. They answer Mary's questions, John's questions, your questions. Okay. So, so we're good at that. All right. Okay. Let's go ahead. We've got. Uh, we got a couple more briefings that we got some important action we got to take care of. So I'm going to terminate this part of it. Let's go ahead. Yes, and let's give uh, Mike Camero for the phase two, uh, two supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Uh, I'll be talking to you this morning about uh, phase two supplement for the regional connectivity study. Uh, just as a little background, the HRT deal approved the Alternative A from Antlers Crossing Supplemental Environment Contract Statement back in October of 2016. And that approval was to uh, uh, to include uh, HRBT improvement and also an improvement of Bowers Hill Interchange. Uh, HR Tax supported that preferred alternative and allocated up to $7 million to study the feasibility of the unselected alternative to all the other colored lines on that map. In May of 2017, uh, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the HRT Bill and the TAC and BDOT to advance that work as follows. $4 million is allocated to the Bowers Hill Interchange Study, which has been conducted by BDOT, and $3 million with a possible $4 million contingency was allocated for the Regional Connectors Study. And that's all the, all the rest of the lines on that. In May of 27, I mean May 17, 2018, uh, HRPO authorized the executive director to enter a contract with Michael Baker International to conduct the regional connector study. And we have two uh, representatives from Michael Baker this morning uh, sitting in the audience here in case we have any specific comment uh, questions that they might better answer for you. Uh, early on, we decided that uh, it, it didn't make sense to do one big $3 million study. It would make a lot more sense to divide it into phases 
each phase having its own uh, budget and kind of do it in smaller chunks. So that's what we did. And this group approved uh, phase one. Uh, during the February 2019 HRTP award meeting phase, uh, we, we reported that phase one was complete. Uh, that phase included the development of the engagement and outreach plan for the regional connector study. Also, the evaluation of the regional travel demand model for use in the RCS. A determination of scenario planning options was also included, as well as updating existing conditions data. And then uh, the, the last piece of phase one was to develop the scope for phase two. Well, when we came to in February, the steering committee and the working group for RCS were not completely comfortable with the full scope that was presented to them for phase two, and they asked for a little bit more time to nail down the details on phase two. So this board approved the scaled down version of that phase two scope of work, schedule, and budget in February so that we could keep the project moving forward. Since then, the RCS working group and steering committee have determined the additional work to be completed in phase two. So I'd like to walk you through a couple of slides to show you the differences in, in those phases. This is the original set of tasks and schedule for the phase two that was originally proposed by the, the consultant. And uh, up in the upper left hand, on the upper right hand corner, you can see that uh, this schedule goes through January of 2020. Uh, the scaled down version that you approved in February took out several pieces of this, including a portion of the engagement plan, all of task two, which had to do with, uh, uh, with identifying preliminary alternatives, and all of task three, which had to do with doing a congestion assessment of those alternatives. It also took out pieces of uh, task four down here, which has to do with conducting scenario planning. Uh, when we moved forward with the supplement, basically what you do is we, we're still holding off on those uh, items under the engagement plan and the uh, development of alter alternatives, which will be done a little bit later in the study. So they're not being eliminated, they're just being referred to after the scenario planning work is done. And what you see added is this small uh, few uh, rows in green, which have to do with completing the scenario planning work. So that's the primary piece that was added for the supplement. Now there are, are, are little, some of the other items uh, that, that are still on the list have some additional budget in the supplement because there's more meetings and more work to be done. Uh, but the primary thing we added was just getting the rest of that scenario planning were completed by January 2020. Now in terms of the budget, uh, this is hard to read here, but right at the bottom is $857,000, which was approved in February for the scaled down uh, phase two budget. And this slide shows, <coughs> there we go. This slide shows a supplemental budget, which is an additional $780,000. That fits us through the scenario planning uh, framework, assumptions, and so forth. So to sum up, uh, phase two, including the supplement, will complete the development of the scenario planning framework assumption and tools by January 2020. And this is important because it's the same scenario planning work that we'll be using for the 2045 LRTP. So we have to have that ready to use by January 2020 to stay on our LRTP schedule, which has a hard deadline of June 2021. Uh, it's important that the RCS and the LRTP use the same assumptions for the uh, scenario planning since eventually if you want a project to be built it's going to have to make it into our own transportation plan. The uh, phase two will also determine the scope of work for the next phase of the study, which will be what the work is occurring after January 2020. So to, to total the budget for phase two when you add up the scaled down version and supplement, you get a total budget of $1.6 million. So the recommended action for today is to approve the Regional Connector Study Phase 2 supplement that was attached to your agendas uh, and we had sections that were, that were added as a supplement highlighted. So hopefully you got a color copy so you can see those pieces highlighted in yellow. Uh, and we're also asking uh, for authorization for the executive director to enter into a contract with the consultant for this big piece of the study. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, this uh, action item for we'll vote on an uh, APH. Any questions? 
Okay, seeing none. Okay, uh, now we move on to, we've got to um, defer the uh, State of the Transportation 2018 briefing that uh, Keith Nichols going to give us. I think we'll take that into the next meeting. That's going to be an important briefing because it's got a lot of great information in it. Okay, uh, moving to the meeting agenda, public comment period to have uh, John Gurdley come forward, please. Three minutes. Let's walk up, man. I've been hacking. Should you walk? Got it going. Now, we take you three minutes. Here, take your time. Uh, some of my classes here. Uh, then, John Gregory, I want to comment on the, the presentation we just saw in the BDOT study. We talked about providing an analytical baseline, but then when the delegate Yancey asked if you just did a run with out any hot lane, without any uh, squeezing, changing, just open uh, open flow of traffic, you didn't do that run. That would be the baseline. There's no such thing as a baseline where you start with already artificial fleet clogging up the lanes. I mean, I'm a piping system designer. When, when, when we, anytime you do a piping system, you run your first flows with everything open just to see what happens. Then you start deciding how you changing and what, what you could adjust. So you will not have a baseline unless you do a total run of all these roads you plan on building with those no artificial chokes, which is the, the hot lanes. Then adjust them as you need it to get your traffic. And I, I just don't see having calling it a baseline. If you don't do a true baseline, just see what your roads will do if they're, if they're, they're naturally allowed to run the way they should be. So thank you. Okay, that's all I have for that. Moving on, see there um, submitted public comments. There were none, and there are no uh, transcribed public comments. Okay, now we're going to move into action item, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, kind of make this flow, make sure we get everybody get the votes so and understand what's going on. Pulling item 18F from the consent agenda, um, and then we will, we will address those separately. We'll talk about it at this moment. 18 F is the budget, and I will hear from uh, Mayor Rowe from the Personnel Budget Committee. We have two motions to make, and we'll vote independently on each motion. Okay? We start with the chair of the budget. I'm going to move that we adopt the consent uh, agenda uh, A through I, with the exception of F. Okay, we can do that. Motion was made. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, opposed? Aye. Well, I use a committee. You don't need it for a committee. So. Okay, um, let's go to then the recommendation from the uh, Personnel Budget Committee. Yes, sir. Uh, the Personnel Budget Committee recommends that we adopt the proposed operating budget for fiscal year 2020. And that's our motion. The budget for the say that again. Move approval of the uh, operating budget for Okay, you want to do the, the, uh, the uh, we'll do this one. Do the thing. Okay, I guess I didn't care. All right, so the budget item uh, is going to be 18F for a budget. All in favor say aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. uh, pardon? Mm -hmm. We need a second. Yeah. Well, actually, all right, we have a committee nomination. I mean, committee motion. Once you have a committee motion of the Robert Steele's award, do not require a second. Okay? All right, now, back it up just a little bit. The, normally, the uh, consent agenda would not be a committee recommendation. Okay, that would be from the floor. So, I'm going to have to have another call on that one. So, for the consent agenda, it's not a committee recommendation. Minus item 18. Um, we have a motion that was made. Do I have a second? Sir. Okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Good. Now we got to do that one. Now for the personnel budget, okay, the budget uh, personnel uh, committee has recommended that we pass the budget. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Feel the warmth there on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, now the second motion from the uh, 
personnel budget committee based on the outcome of the uh, executive director's evaluation. Uh, the committee moves that uh, we recommend the executive director receive an annual salary increase of 2.5% as approved in the budget and all other compensation remains the same. And again, that's the motion from the committee. Okay, uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion to pass. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, you have three months scheduled. Uh, and item at, uh, 19, correspondence of interest. You have uh, minutes of the HR TPO advisory committee meeting. Item 22, uh, and uh, excuse me, 21, 22 is for your information. And you have a comment. Yes, just reminding everyone that uh, for those staying for the PDC meeting, we do have lunch over behind our reception area, and the Planning District Commission meeting will begin at 1230. And 12.30. 12.30, all the business. Okay, and uh, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.